Hello, my name is Andre Ward and I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. Welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the legal system from various perspectives, including people most impacted by the criminal legal system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and we highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone being affected. We ask you, the viewers, to spread the word about both sides of the bars and share your comments with us on Twitter, at the Fortune SOC. Today's show is really, really important as we are thinking about what's happening throughout the country and as we think about narrative changes that are needed to portray the criminal legal system in a more favorable light as it relates to people who are impacted by it. And so the title of this show is Changing the Narrative, the Media's Role in Criminal Legal System Reform. And when writing about reform in the criminal legal system, it is important for the media to really get it right. But how accurate is reporting? According to some advocates, there's a real need for changes to promote greater accuracy and humanity by identifying and counteracting potentially harmful reporting. In this episode, we have two advocates who will discuss media accuracy and what they believe are necessary changes. There are M.K. Karshane, who is a partner at Karshane and Klein LLC, which is a New York City-based boutique civil rights and criminal defense firm who began her career as a public defender and continues to primarily represent individuals and their loved ones harmed by the New York City Police Department and Department of Corrections. Also joining us is Daiwan Patro, a legal system reform advocate and strategist. And as an alumnus of the Bard Prison Initiative, he has leveraged his education and experience to shift public policy in favor of expanding college and prison. Daiwan and MK, thank you so much for, for joining me today. We really appreciate you weighing in on this really timely and really important discussion around changing the narrative and the media's role in criminal legal system reforms. And, you know, I'll get right to it. Um, you all are no strangers to this work. You know, you have been immersed in this work for some time I, as someone directly impacted uh, or someone who saw things on the periphery but sought to get deeper into the center of it to really change things. And so I'll, I'll start off with you, Daiwan, right? You know, Daiwan, as you're thinking about this work, you know, what role does the media play in manufacturing consent? around crime and policing. And I've heard you use this term before about manufacturing consent. So talk to us about that. Like what is the role of media in playing in manufacturing consent around crime and policing? Yeah, so manufacturing consent is um, a analytical framework for understanding how the media functions in regard to persuading, manipulating how we perceive the world, right? It is a mass media concept. And what we see around crime, particularly in New York City, is that media coverage around crime, specifically around bail reform, is in total disproportion to actual crime rates, right? And if we change um, our frame here and look at just Fox News, right, what we see is that in early September, Fox's crime coverage ticked up exponentially, not because there was any uptick or spike in crime in the U.S., but because Democrats had begun leading in national polls in the generic ballot, right? And so what we're seeing is organiz media organizations like Fox playing a political game around crime coverage rather than informing the public around real public safety issues. And I know some people may be thinking about what I'm saying and say, well, I don't watch Fox News. Why does that matter to me? Well, Fox's coverage spiked. Democrats started responding to that on the campaign trail. And then what we see is that CNN and MSNBC's coverage, there's a lag time, but then their coverage also spikes, not as dramatically. So Fox is not happening. Their coverage is not unfolding in a vacuum, right? What is said on Vox, Fox News affects the larger media um, environment, and we're seeing rampant scaremongering 
almost unchecked, right? You, if you're someone like me who watches this and are attuned to it, it is almost insane. It is definitely absurd. And it is what I would say, you know, journalistic malpractice. Yeah, and when you think about that, right, our colleague Scott from Zealous had just tweeted out something, right, that showed, right, while, you know, crime has been like a certain, at a certain level, not a major spike or increase, but at a certain level is pretty steady. The media coverage of crime, however, is disproportionately higher than what is actually happening with crime in and of itself, which speaks to this kind of like misinformation and false narrative and how, you know, our communities oftentimes in viewing criminal justice issues, right, looks at it from this fatalistic and narrow kind of perspective. I want to turn to you, MK, right, to kind of talk about, you know, bail reform. I know you're focusing on that and some other things. So what did bail reform in New York set out to do? And, and what is the status of the law now? And how has the use of language in certain narratives impacted the fight over the law? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for that question. And you know, I think that it's everything that I want to want to echo and is echoed actually in the answer that I'm about to give, which is that bail reform went into effect in 2020. It was passed in 2019. And the purpose of the law was in certain limited scenarios to somewhat even the playing field between people who had money, just financial means, liquid wealth, and those who did not. Because what had been happening and what continues honestly to happen in some iterations is that people who can afford to buy their freedom or the freedom of their loved ones remain free pre-trial, and those who cannot afford that don't. And so effectively, bail was functioning as a means test. And it continues to do that, by the way. But it was the, the effect of bail reform was to at least eliminate that issue in certain cir circumstances. And that mainly applied to lower level cases. So we're talking about misdemeanor cases, uh, felonies that are not classified as violent and other limited scenarios. Um, and also there are significant exceptions. So for example, if someone is on parole or if they're rearrested, there were scenarios in which an otherwise bail ineligible case would become eligible for bail. So we're not talking about sweeping huge reforms, certainly not the sort of radical reforms that it was cast as by its opponents. Um, and yet, bail reform was the subject of a significant misinformation campaign and continues to be. Uh, you hear the bail reform rallying cry by the GOP, but also accepted by, as a framework by Democrats and to their detriment, because what we have is a very successful policy that did introduce a modicum, really, so so little uh, equality into the system, the pretrial system, um, and yet it was really scapegoated for anything and everything that went wrong, including at the height of COVID. Uh, you know, while other issues are happening where people are suffering economically and with their health and with the death of their loved ones and being disrupted in all sorts of ways, bail reform was still being pointed to inaccurately, of course, as the scapegoat there. And the law is still intact, but not totally. So it actually went through two rounds of rollbacks as a result of that concerted disinformation campaign, um, once by Governor, former Governor Andrew Cuomo, and again under current Governor Kathy Hochul. And so the law is still intact somewhat, but significant rollbacks were already made, um, unfortunately, because in large part, Democrats did accept this fear-mongering framework from Republicans and attempt to sort of out-jail them, which is something that we should never be engaging in at all. Yeah, when you think about that, right, the notion of what bail reform was designed to do is essentially, right, to allow for people, right, who had not been convicted of many crimes or anything to, at least in some measures, right, to be able to be with their families, right, while they're facing uh, whatever charges that they have been accused of. And yet, by denying people access to bail simply because they may be in poverty, right, they actually contribute towards like negative forms of, of like public safety because as people are put in jails, right, science and, and research suggests that when you're incarcerated, right, it can further lead to more crime, right? And more people being involved in those behaviors because of the way in which the system is designed itself. So that's really important. But I want to turn to you, Daiwan, too, because you know how are act advocates and activists using like Twitter and other means of social media to count, counter disinformation. Um, I think Twitter, and you know, especially concerning what's happening right now with Elon Musk as CEO, 
you know, Twitter has been a critical tool in countering disinformation in the world, right? And again, as I spoke about how what happens on Fox News doesn't happen in a vacuum, what we in the advocacy community are able to do on, on, um, on what, what we in the advocacy community are able to do on Twitter shows up on CNN, shows up on MSNBC, shows up on Fox News, right? Sometimes you pull up whole media articles and they're just um, sort of long strings of people's tweets that tell a story around an issue, right? And specifically on Twitter around criminal justice reform and advocacy and bail reform, in particular, we've been able to set the record straight, right? And to call out the media for being disingenuous, to call out politicians when they are fear mongering to present people, people with data and facts, right? We don't hear about the 200,000 people who are free back in their communities with their families, going to work every day, not sitting in jail simply because they couldn't fill, um, afford bail on Fox 5, right? But you can find that information on Twitter. We don't hear that New York is the safest out of the six largest cities in America um, on Fox 5. But you can find that on Twitter, right? You don't hear that Manhattan, Queens, in the Bronx are in the top 15 safest counties in this country, safer than Nassau County, um, in fact. But you can find that on Twitter. So Twitter is a critical, critical tool for us um, not only to get information out to people and counter disinformation, but really to push and change the narrative in the larger media universe. Um, and we've been doing that and we've been effective at it, but, but it only goes so far, right? What we really, really need is for our policymakers to take positions that are grounded in reality, that are grounded in facts. Right. When I see the media running stories on bail reform every day or running stories on shootings in New York City every day, when shootings are going down, not up. Right. We have a problem. Right. When we are talking about bail reform in the number of people who are released pre-trial. Right. Is the same today as it was before um, bail reform was implement implemented in New York. There has been no change in the number of people rearrested, but the news is not telling people that. And politicians find it all too easy because they're often misinformed mm -hmm. to roll with these larger, broader media narratives rather than countering that. Right. And, you know, I've been really, really impressed by how um, John Fetterman has stood up to the tax and pencil against him in Pennsylvania around him hiring two formerly incarcerated and wrongfully convicted men onto his campaign. And he stood by just simply doing the right thing in the facts of the case, right? Those were two wrongfully convicted men. If we had Democrats in New York and nationally doing that, we would be having a totally different conversation today and we'd have Republicans on the fence around their lies and fear mongering rather um, defending social justice and social equity policies like bail reform. Absolutely. And you think about it, Daiwan, right? The narratives that are being put out there around bail reform are, again, not rooted in facts. Um, they're lies and they're unscientific, right? And yet people run with that. And obviously, MK, I want to bring you in to chime a little bit more on that, but also want to pose another question to you, right, in terms of your work right, with young adults. Like, how have you know you seen language being weaponized against them um, in the media, and and what has the impact been like for them? Yeah, of course. So so language is so important. The way that we otherize people, or conversely, the way that we bring them into community, um, you know, that's with language, right? So ways that I've seen it especially impact young people that I work with is through the use of gang labeling. Um, of course, I want to be clear, people who are affiliated are allowed to be affiliated. There's nothing actually illegal or wrong inherently about being part of a crew. But the gang labels that are used are really weaponized by police departments, by district attorneys to really vilify people. Right. And so when you see even victims of police brutality who are then cast as gang members or thugs or gangbangers or these really racially loaded terms that are used to generalize and to label them and to signal to the community and to viewers and to the audience, they're not worthy of empathy or 
sympathy or your compassion or freedom or health or well-being, right? Those are really important things that are happening. And when we go back to that idea of manufactured consent, the important thing about manufactured consent is not just that the message is being put out there, it's then being synthesized and adopted by the audience. So what you have are people who are hearing this misinformation, believing that it's true, often due to the source. You know, we're talking about police departments, district attorneys, people who are taught, were conditioned socially to believe are the experts on crime or well-being or safety, um, telling us that something's true even when it's not, um, portraying things as accurate, and then quoting the will of their audience that they had willfully deceived in order to justify the implementation of more policies that you know jail, jail more people, that other more people, that exclude more people from the social contract. And that's what we have over and over again, not just with bail reform, but also with other forms of incarceration, with lack of access to food and health care and, and homes. And, and so we see that in every facet of life. And when people are wrongly in the belief that if they personally are not impacted by the criminal legal punishment system, um, that they're going to be fine. That's not true, right? We're all interconnected and all of these things are related to one another. And so we're really all getting sicker for our reliance on jail and prison and the other things that harm our communities, our loved ones and our neighbors. And that leads me obviously to, to Daiwan, right? In terms of, you know, the need to organize, Right, people in a way that has impact to counter these narratives. You know, how can we begin to further hold the media accountable, Daiwan, for publishing misleading information? Well, I think one of the ways of doing that is canceling your subscription, right? I canceled my subscription to the New York Times because of their constant blatant lies around bail reform in New York, right? And also in in tangent in tandem with doing that, right, plugging yourself into alternative and trusted, trustworthy media sources, right? There's some really, really amazing people that you can follow on Twitter if you want real and accurate information about what is happening around crime and criminality um, in New York City and in America, right? And then I think also we just sort of drill down really into better educating people about how to analyze statistics and how to use data and also bringing facts into what are, I think, some really, really subjective conversations that we have every day with not even, you know, people we work with, um, people we sit down to the dinner table with. You know, I have friends who say to me things like, you know, oh, I don't feel safe in New York City. And I said, well, why not? Right. And then we have this whole conversation and it turns out that they learn that from the news. Right. They don't feel safe because the news told them to feel safe. And I say, well, actually, here are the facts. And like what you're saying doesn't align with your reality. You've never been impacted by crime. Right. And yet you feel unsafe. Right. You should have a problem with the media for playing on your fears and susceptibility to crime and criminality in this country, which is deeply rooted in systemic racism. Right. And so. We have to have those conversations. We have to better educate people. We have to be looking for reliable and trustworthy media sources. And even around policing, right? People think that policing produces public safety. There was just a study that came out in California that showed that policemen 89% of their time making traffic stops and were stopping black people five to one to white people, right? That does not produce public safety. That produces revenue for the counties that they're in, right? And so most people, when I'm having a conversation with them around policing, they actually have no idea what police do, right? And I have to walk them back and say, hey, the police are not producing public safety, right? The road to public safety is us making decisions and allocating resources in society that make communities safer. That is housing, that is healthcare, that is education, right? The most the most police communities in our society are the least safe, right? And part of this entire equation is how the media has impacted how people think about crime, criminality, policing, right? We have to unplug from the MSNBCs and the CNNs, right? Because they are addicted to law and order, to crimes of narrative. And Andre, not because they want to, um, inform people or educate people because it sells, 
right? Fear sells. We have to continue to call them out, but we have to unplug and find trustworthy sources to get information, particularly around crime criminality. And there's some great publications out there, right? If you're not someone who wants to follow someone on Twitter, right? Sign up for The Appeal. Sign up for The Marshall Project. Watch shows like this, right? You will be better informed and less scared. And that is a positive. Absolutely. And, you know, when you think about this, and I'm going to turn to you, MK, as we, we move to close soon. But, you know, when you think about this, this racialized system, right, in the sense of, of institutional and systemic racism as it relates to policing, right, there are many that maintain and, and arguably say that on the one hand, in black and brown communities, it's about law and order. But in other communities that are non non black or brown and white communities, more affluent communities, or just white communities generally, it's about serve and protect. And that whole notion, right, of, of how policing affects communities is something that's significant and how the narrative is told based on that dynamic. And so MK, I want to turn to you, right, because you have been doing some, some additional work, right, around this looking at the way of policing is happening in communities. And why are police versions of events so often taken at face value and repeated by the media without fact checking? And what impact does this have on public perception? Yeah, I think that's such a great question. So as a civil rights attorney, so you know, I, I was a public defender for several years and then I became a civil rights attorney. So I've been working with victims of police misconduct and brutality for my entire career, but also as a lifelong New Yorker, this is something that I've always cared about. These are our community members. These are our neighbors. These are my loved ones, your loved ones um, that this is happening to. And so it matters so, so much. Um, and I think that for two things, you know, we need to not just professionalize this issue, you know, in terms of like, you know, I think that there's a sense that only you know a pundit class cares about this in a way that they you know people have the luxury of talking about abolition or police abolition only if they're in a neighborhood that is safe and that just isn't true at all and it erases the work of incredible black and brown people who've been doing this for so much longer than many famous white people have um, and so we need to really focus on that need this there's been a need here for so long for an alternative to policing that is not criminal ba criminality based that is not carceral that is a true alternative as in a replacement, as in not something to reform it, as in not something to improve it, because the system can't be improved. This is not something that, this is not a system that has ever been open to oversight, accountability, or actual reforms in anything but name value. And therefore we need to stop trying it. Um, and it's also you know, important, I think, that so many of the leaders on issues such as bail reform, like we're talking about assembly member Latrice Walker, she represents a district that is impacted both by community safety concerns. Her constituents want to be safe, just like everyone does, but also supports bail reform. And there's a reason for that. It's because bail does not make communities safer. You know, imposing a ransom for a person's life doesn't improve safety anywhere. Um, and so I think that's important when we talk, think about policing, too. Right. This is not something that should be limited to people who have experienced police brutality, uh, but to all of us, because it really is in service of creating a safer New York. And the reason that you know, police officer accounts are taken at face value is because we're conditioned to do that. Um, you know, they are in, they're working in service to their own authority, to their own power, to their own funding. I mean, they're, they're starving communities of resources while funding themselves. And there's a reason that that continues to happen. And we are conditioned by, by media, um, by media we consume for fun, right? <laughs> by law and order, by SVU, um, you know, by the Bensons and Stablers of the world that, you know, people, uh, you know, lionize and, and yet what they're really doing is incredibly harmful. Um, and we're also taught to look at them as experts, right? Uh, experts on how to keep us safe, experts on how to reduce the harm that are caused in communities. And yet what we see over and over again that the police are the harm in communities. Police are causing harm um, and they're not actually an answer to safety because if America were, you know, America is the most policed place in the world. It's the most heavily incarcerated place in the world. Um, and so if we could incarcerate and police our way to safety, we'd be there by now, but we can't. Right. Policing has failed. It's a failed experiment. And it's really time that we recognize that that's the case. Absolutely. And I want to take this time, right, as we're going to close. But Daiwan, in 30 seconds, right, can you just some closing thoughts and then I'll turn it to MK and then we'll wrap it up, unfortunately. But we will have you all back because it's important that our viewers understand the importance of narrative shifting and changing as it relates to the criminal legal punishment system.
So Daiwan, closing closing thoughts. Um, I will just say that you know countering disinformation works. Holding um, elected officials accountable works. We have seen some really admirable moments, both from um, um, the Assembly Speaker Hasty here in New York, as well as um, the Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart Cousins, where they stood up to the New York City Mayor and said, "No, we are going to stand on the side of data." and not do any bill rollbacks because they're going to harm communities of color and have no relation to actual public safety, right? And that is from advocacy. That is from people doing research, from sitting down with them and presenting them with the facts, right? Um, and we have to keep that pressure on and we need to applaud them when they do that and call them out when they succumb to fear mongering. Thank you. And MK. That's exactly right. Really thinking critically and, and standing up for each other, right? You know, when I when I introduce myself, I want to say I'm also I'm a mom. I'm a New Yorker. I'm someone who also wants to be safe. I'm someone who wants to live in community, and I use my JD in service of that, right? But that's really what it's all about um, is really just thinking, seeing the people behind these stories. Um, you know, very very quickly, I represent the family of Sahid Basil. Um, his image was used by Lee Zeldin in a despicable ad that shows Sahid in his final final moments of life, but is intended to paint him as though he's about to harm somebody. And it's overlaid with the message that you need to vote like your life depends on it because it just might, very clearly showing that we're supposed to be afraid of Sahid Basil. A man who was experiencing a mental health crisis was and is so loved by his community and his family. And yet we're seeing him used as a pawn in this disgusting and exploitative way. And that's the way it works, right? If people don't look and drill into these things critically and see the people behind these messages, we're going to keep manufacturing consent for more of what's killing all of us. MK, Daiwan, I just wanna thank you both for giving your thoughts and, and sharing observations about this really, really important issue. And I wanna thank you, the viewers, for joining us for this really thought-provoking conversation. In the meantime, on behalf of the Fortune Society, we thank you so much for tuning in to both sides of the bars. If you're interested in finding out more about the Fortune Society, please check us out on the web at fortunesociety.org. That's fortunesociety.org or on Facebook by typing in the fortunesociety.org. Uh, this is Andre Ward and I appreciate you all every month for joining us here as we critically look at both sides of the bars. Thank you.